is The Pastor's Heart. And I wonder if you could help us get the word out about The Pastor's Heart. Uh, if you have an iPhone or an iPad, uh, we'd love you to subscribe using uh, this URL, uh, bit.ly slash thepastorsapple. And uh, it, we'd love it if you could give us a rating in the iTunes store, make some sort of review as well. If you've got an Android device, uh, the URL to subscribe to is uh, bit.ly slash thepastorsandroid. Uh, if you're on Spotify and listen to podcasts on Spotify, then uh, just type into your browser bit.ly thepastorsspotify. And uh, finally, if you're somebody who subscribes on YouTube, then it's bit.ly slash the pastors YouTube and uh, look if you'd like to support us in this ministry and we would really appreciate that uh, there are production costs streaming costs promotion costs and uh, if you are benefiting and would like to chip in perhaps a few dollars a month uh, then that would be wonderful and the URL to do that is called bit.ly slash the pastors patreon that's how we're doing those things now coming up over the next few weeks we're going to be talking to David Cook next week former principal of Sydney Missionary and Bible College uh, he's going to be speaking to us about how to preach to the heart uh, Keith and Sarah Condy are coming in to talk about the pastor's marriage and their new marriage course that's just about to be released uh, Valerie Ling is going to be here to talk about stress and burnout Rory Shiner is uh, going to be our guest he's going to be over here in, per in Sydney from Perth for the launch uh, a whole Donald Robinson pro project that he's been working on and uh, we'll be talking to him about that Mark Devers coming in uh, Steve Cree Kanishka Rafael uh, they're just some of the guests over the next few weeks on the pastor's heart but today our guest is Andrew Barry and welcome Andrew Andrew uh, is married to Ruth the father of five um, and on the staff at Janali Anglican Church mm -hmm. and going to be speaking on the Nexus Conference a couple of weeks next month mm. on evangelism in the spirit. Tell us about that. Well, it's very exciting, actually. Um, I feel like I'm not a anything amazing. I'm not a great evangelist, but I tell you, the one thing that I'm relying on everything is that God who opens doors and God who opens hearts. And um, I've seen him doing a lot of that recently, so I'm very encouraged to be there. Great. We're looking forward to that. Now, two years ago... Your son, Nathan, died, and I'm going to ask you to share some of the things you've learned, some of the journey that you've been on with God and your family's been on with God, but just can you orientate us, um, tell us some of the story before that, um, leading up to his death, the initial cancer diagnosis, that kind of thing. Sure. Yeah. Nathan, um, wonderful boy, he's um, my second oldest boy, into sport, into uh very good at reading people, um, but in 2016 he had headaches, which we found was brain cancer, and we found there was cancers throughout his body. It was something that was very, um, very serious, and we treated. But a year later, um, many people prayed for him. We were supported massively, but he, he died two years ago, um, on the 12th of January in 2017. And so, as you can imagine, actually we were going on a holiday. Mm -hmm. It was going to be like. We didn't call it our last holiday because we didn't know if it was our last, but it, it was pretty hard driving away on holiday and uh, then driving back with one less child. Mm. Yeah. Then the two years since then, it's been a, um, well, a, 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 a complex journey. Yeah. Sure. What's, um, tell us some of that. I think... I think there's a few things. It's a bit. Um, there's obviously things that happen to you. Things come in waves. I heard someone say it was a bit like a um, when you're at the beach, you brace yourself for the next wave to come, and you can handle it. But sometimes another wave comes when you're not bracing yourself and you get knocked out a bit. And so I think there's been just different seasons in our in our the last uh, two years. Um, God has been incredibly good to us. We've been surrounded by love, by prayer, by really kind acts of people towards us and um yeah, he's been with us the whole way through but it's been hard mm. i mean i'm imagining you've learnt and you've felt every stage every wave of the grief cycles that they mm. talk about mm. maybe maybe just in terms of shaping how we go mm. shock was the first one mm -hmm. yeah. well, one of the things i read dominic was a uh, was given a book about um about the stages of grief and uh, the book was very helpful actually it reminded me to think that every stage of grief is an opportunity for you to 
it's a gift from God, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and so an opportunity for you to grow closer to God or an opportunity for you to go away. And so like the shock at the beginning, you, you kind of have to do so many things, <clears throat> make so many decisions, and you sort of have an energy just to get things done, to organize a, a burial service for my son with with my family and some yeah. of Nathan's closest school friends and then organize a huge Thanksgiving service with thousand people. And that shock God gives you mm. some strength, but then you just totally wrecked afterwards. Yeah. Um, and then the other stages of grief come things like, um, um, I think isolation and loneliness, you know, reach a point where everyone else is has kind, kind of, of emotionally moved on. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's right. I mean, often it's the case that the funeral, for some people, is the end of their grieving, but for the family, it's quite honestly only the beginning, mm -hmm. and and it's not their fault. And I I've moved on with other people who've grieved, and 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 they're still grieving. But there's a loneliness, and so I think one of the things I've been reminded of is at that loneliness, I can either choose to draw closer to God, or I can withdraw from everyone. And I think that's been really good for us in terms of just drawing closer to God in our prayers. And well, take us through one of those moments when you thought, "Wow, I mean." I do really feel isolated or I do really feel down or lonely. Yeah. Oh, there's been many, Dominic. Um, and sometimes it happens all at once. I mean, it's, you know, quite honestly, on the anniversaries of things, we brace ourselves for those. Mm -hmm. But then I've actually found the hardest days usually the day after. <laughs> so right. everyone's praying for you. You're saying, how are you going to get through this one, this first year anniversary since Nathan's gone to be with the Lord Jesus Christ? And... The day after is harder because it's not an anniversary and we've done a year. It's just hard. Mm -hmm. So I think um, it's at those moments that you just call to pray more and call to rely on God more. But also the temptation is to, to withdraw from other people. And, um, and I've done that. And I think I've made mistakes in my family. Sometimes I've just wanted to switch off. Mm -hmm. Listen to podcasts, no, <laughs> but uh, well, not 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 wholly good podcasts like this, but other you know other podcasts, Dominic, and yeah. but withdrawing from family, withdrawing from other people, there's an unhealthiness about that. And if my wife was on, she could proclaim that I've been unhealthy in that withdrawing. But also, there's a sense of drawing closer to God, and then drawing to other people too. Yeah. Mm. You told me about the word bargaining. Uh, that people have used in the grief stage. What did you mean by that? Well, just I mean, it's one of the stages of grief is bargaining and ask and asking God. Actually, to be honest, I, it hasn't. I haven't ever hit that one. I don't know why. Um, I I must admit that sometimes I look at a photo of Nathan and I'll say sorry, and mm -hmm. I just say it. I don't. It's not. I'm not. I don't know if I'm saying it to Nathan or just about myself. I think, oh man, so many things I could have done. But um, yeah, it's not. It's not so much bargaining, excuse me. Mm. Anger? Anger. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't think I've been angry at God. I have been certainly um, poured out my heart to God and other people have been angry at God. But um, but if I did become angry, I, I would certainly, I think what I should do with it is, is like the psalmist do and, and just and bring it to the throne of, of grace mm -hmm. and, and deal with it that way, yeah. Mm. Um, how has counselling helped? Yeah, I've actually I actually saw a a Christian counsellor midway through last year, and it was very very helpful. Um, I'd actually only ever gone to see a counsellor once before, Dominic, and mm -hmm. maybe I shouldn't say this, but one time a long time ago, I went to see a Christian a, a counsellor who wasn't a Christian, mm -hmm. and uh, the counsellor said to me, "You've got to start, see yourself more as a god than a human." <laughs> and I thought, <laughs> "I'm a Christian. I'm not God." <laughs> And so I hadn't seen counselling since then. But so, but this but time, you had understood that it'd been useful for other people. <laughs> well, not that counsellor, not, no, 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 not that advice. Yeah, no, yeah, no, yeah, I knew, yeah, knew it'd yeah. be helpful, and I'd recommend many people to counselling. But, yeah. but I actually said, um, but this was very helpful, and and Ruth gave me really good advice. My wife gave me really good advice that map a bit of time out after you see the counsellor, mm. just to walk and process. And so it was one of those times. Um, it was only halfway through last year, a year and a half after Nathan died, I mm -hmm. first reached out for counselling, and. Um, but one of the things that he helped me see or I understood myself is that there were sort of three things that I was, have these negative emotions were getting missed up. So I was sad uh, and I was stressed and sometimes I felt like a failure at things. And so I think sometimes when I was feeling sad about Nathan and there's nothing wrong with that, I'd start to have all the stress and the feeling like a failure just pouring into me at mm. once. Almost like the, all these negative emotions 
were messed together. And I think also when I was feeling stressed about things, like we had a couple weekends away, I was organizing two weekends and two week, you know, two weekends away, two weeks apart from each other. And I think when I was feeling stressed, suddenly the waves of sorrow came into that. Came in, yeah. And so I think one of the things I found very helpful, and I, I hope it's helpful to someone out there listening, is that separate those things. It's okay. Let sorrow be sorrow. Just, just let be sad. And that's fine. In fact, do something with it. Someone said, if you get waves of sorrow, what you should do is pull out a photo. Don't suppress it. Mm-hmm. Embrace it. Pull out a photo. Um, reminisce. Think. Um, but let the sorrow be sorrow, and don't let it turn to you know the other things. Like you feel like mm-hmm. a failure, or other things. But um, yeah, I, I found that very helpful, and I've I, I would recommend yeah speaking to, to someone about that, and, and particularly think don't don't let your negative emotions all become blended together because God's given us all of them for a reason I think you know sadness so that we can rightly mourn stress rightly understood so we can just get things done and mm. and you know sometimes we do fail mm. <laughs> but often it's 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 off the radar because we're, we're not not understanding mm. ourselves properly How have you gone as a father and a husband and looking after the others in your family who presumably in their different ways are going through the same kind of yeah cycle yeah I think I think it's very important. Um, one thing, one thing, sorry, one thing I miss that surprised me about Nathan was touch, mm-hmm. and I'm sure, so I'm sure other people miss that as well when they've lost someone. But I, 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 I think I hug my boys more. Mm-hmm. I've always hugged my girl and I hug my little them when they're babies, but I think. When, when your boys are nineteen and sixteen mm. and fifteen, you tend to as an you, Australian male, you tend to not hug them. Yeah. And I think one of the things I've tried to do is, is just embrace them a lot more, and they've wanted that. Mm-hmm. And I've, I think it's fantastic. Um, Ruth and I had set up date nights that we tried to do as often as we could when Nathan was sick, and there have been seasons where we haven't kept that going. But um, that's been good for us. Um, and I think just listening to each other. Ruth, Ruth teaches me a lot about grieving. She talks about her, um, she puts on like a coat, that's how she describes it, or a, that, that, that in, a, in a sense mentally she's all over the coat of the promises of God. And in the morning when she faces stuff, she puts that on and there's promises about, you know, never I leave you, never I forsake you, promises about the place Christ has for us in heaven, promises for, for us about the things that, that, that Nathan deeply believed, which was that um, to live is Christ and to die is gain. And um, we've had to walk that together. It's, I think these moments are potentials for people because we all grieve differently to, to pull apart a bit. Mm. I mean, they do say that couples who've lost a child have a higher percentage of marriage breakdown. Yeah, than, yeah I could understand yeah. that, and I, and I would be... be um, pouring my heart out to anyone who's in that situation and say, well, the first thing you've got to do is love your, love your wife mm-hmm. and love your kids that, 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 that are still with you. Yeah. Mm. Um, and, and the other kids, how, how's their journey been? Look, they're all been different. And I think um, it's hit us all at different times. Mm-hmm. So there was a wonderful man in our church. He died a couple of weeks ago. And um, for some of the kids that opened up grief again, mm-hmm. which is, 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 is right and natural. And for, for others, um, there's, there's been times where it's sort of, yeah, it's made them maybe be a bit stoic, a bit too stoic maybe. Mm. And um, in my family, <laughs> you probably get the impression even behind my, 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 um, my stoic outside <laughs> you're stoic outside yeah. i'm actually the one in my family who's probably the most emotional dominic and yeah. but but the kids i want to give them permission to be emotional and i so the other day one of my kids said dad i would like to talk to you about about life and about nathan about the future and so i made he made an appointment with me and just came to my office after after school and we talked and prayed and it was really nice mm. really nice yeah mm. um how has it impacted the ministry of Christ Jesus? You're on the staff at a busy church. You're responsible for a congregation. Yeah. Do you know, just 
two years as you've looked back, what have been some of the, yeah. the hard things? What have been some of the joys? Yeah. I think, I think one of the things that I found that I, is that when I was going through, we're looking after Nathan for a year and then the first bit of um, after he died was my time frames were just different, Dominic. So it was all, um, it was all eternity and all now. It was all, it was two time frames. I was just, I was just getting ready for heaven and what are we going to get through today? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think there's a lot of strength in that because the gospel is about that. The gospel is about what opportunities does the Lord present to you this very day and how can you get ready for life forever with Christ? Mm -hmm. um, but I think um, one of the things that, uh, that I struggle with a little bit is planning a bit ahead. Mm -hmm. I think people who grieve or go through hard times find it hard to... I couldn't plan... When Nathan was sick. I couldn't plan three months ahead. I didn't know what was going to happen. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, we planned a holiday, but it was just, didn't know that was going to be his last holiday. You know, we, you don't, we can't plan. And even in grief, I thought that would sort of instantly disappear. Mm -hmm. But I think for me, at least, I can't say for others, it took a while before that kind of three, six, mm -hmm. two year, five year planning could come back in again, which is really important for pastoral ministry. Mm -hmm. And I think for the last six months, it's, it's kicked back in and I'm really excited about where things are going at the moment. But on that hand, I don't want to lose the other perspective. Mm, the eternity. The eternity and right now. Yeah. You know, this is the day we've got this time right now. Mm. And how do we prepare ourselves for eternity? Mm. But I've kept preaching. I preached. Um, we had a couple of weeks. We've had some time off. I probably would have. I probably could have, should have taken a bit more time off. But we kept going. Um, and church people were very, very thankful for that. Like very, very, sorry, very supportive of us in that. Um, yeah, you've talked actually about uh, um, some people in grief um, being t every, people wanting to love them and say yeah. don't want to put any pressure on them, and yet actually keeping themselves busy is good for them. Do you yeah, know, do you want to that's that's one hundred percent true. I think one of the things we have this um, we have this way of helping people in inverted commas in grief, which is actually kind of makes them into the victim. Mm -hmm. and makes them into a helpless person. Um, and particularly someone who's involved in ministry, and they, we, they say they've, they've just lost someone dear to them, and we just say, okay, you've got to stop everything now for a while. Um, but the question is, why? Um, I, I actually think what you should say to, you could say to someone is, look, I want to give you permission to stop mm -hmm. this, permission to stop that. I want to give you a break if you need it. That's a wonderful thing to say, but it's quite different to say to someone, you've got to stop and sort of taking over and telling them what to do. Cause I know people who've lost someone. I know someone who lost a husband and, and she is just a ministry minded person. And I could imagine that she needs to take some breaks and needs to take life easier, but she also, she just wants to serve the Lord. Mm. And, um, not as a therapy. So I don't think I do, I never want to do, or should encourage people to do ministry as a self-therapy. You know, mm -hmm. it's not just for your own it's sake. It's got to be for other person. It's yeah. for the other person, but it's the same as what you were doing before. Um, so I just urge people just to be a bit careful. Instead of assuming that the person should stop everything, maybe talk to them. Mm -hmm. It's always a good start, isn't it, Dominic? Mm -hmm. um, and ask them, what would they like to do? Would they like to have a break? Do they need a break? Mm -hmm. um, give them your support. Say, you know what? We are 100% behind you to back mm -hmm. you with whatever you want. And uh, But we also want to you permission if you need to stop and that, that's what our church did to us and I'm mm. very grateful for that mm. what opportunities for the Lord Jesus have come up um, there's been a lot um, there was a friend who came someone we didn't know came to the Thanksgiving service of Nathan and then introduced ourselves to a family and then earlier last year we invited them along to a um, an evangelist dinner she became a Christian and and started reading the Bible with Ruth um, there's been opportunities for um, th there was uh, opportunities. I, I got a strange one the other day where someone rang up on the phone, very distressed, wanted to speak to a minister. and um, rang the church. Rang the church. I didn't know this person. They wanted to speak to a minister. And I, and I you know, when you get those, you hear those on the answer machine and you think, do I ring back? <laughs> do I wait till Monday? It's a Saturday. Yeah. I've got a Saturday church. I've got to finish my preparation. Sorry, guys out there. I was still a bit of my prep. I was, I was at a camp all week, so busy, but no one's... It's <laughs> Hypothetical. Right. Hypothetical. <laughs> but, but I had to do a bit of work, but I, that person was so distressed. I rang them and they needed me to come and speak to them and, that, and they were leaving the next day. And I went over that day, even though I had other things to do, because it was the right thing to do. I went over them 
and this person had just lost a child and mm -hmm. they'd lost a child two years and one day from the time I'd lost my child. They wanted to speak to a minister and they didn't know they were getting a minister who'd, who'd, been through the same who'd also lost a child and yeah. could read the Bible and pray and embrace them and can keep going with that and invite the church and other things. So there's strength. Like I, I think God's, God prepares works for us to walk in. I believe that, you know, we're seated with Christ. We're secure with him. That's where we are in our position. But here on earth, he's got good works and we are to walk in them all the time. And mm. I think God's prepared, prepared good works for me to walk in, even in suffering. Um, there's been many opportunities, Dominic. Um, you tell me about a, a really confronting moment when one of the, a friend of yours who you discipled in the past who's also in ministry and their son was sick with cancer and you having seen your son die mm. were called on to minister to him do you want to just kind of walk us through some yeah of that? so there's a lovely lovely friend of mine pete and mel and they don't mind me saying that they um their son last year january last year so a year after nathan had died their son they were here on holidays as missionaries overseas come to australia and their son had um had cancer, stage four cancer. And um, I knew them. Mm -hmm. Other people knew them, but I knew them, I loved them. And I had I went and visited them in the hospital. But it's a little bit, when you're going to visit someone in a hospital who's just found out their kid has cancer and you're the person whose child has died of cancer mm. the year before, you feel a little bit like, um, do they want that? Don't they want someone who can be the walking embodiment of success not the walking embodiment that that was going through my mind dominic mm. that's not always going through their mind they just wanted to see me as a friend mm -hmm. and they wanted to read the bible with them and pray with them and which i did and i still keep up with pete and in fact we want to his the good news is his child has 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 been treated and it seems like everything is in, in it's it, the cancer's gone mm -hmm. and so we're actually wanting to have get together sometime we, we, we catch up a lot but we want to get together sometime and have a night thinking about one of us has got a child who's had cancer and died. One of us has got a child who's had cancer and live. And how we can help other people, how Christians can help people with sick kids or kids who are, mm -hmm. who are dying. Yeah, so, but it's confronting. But I know, I also know that I've, you know, this is what God wants me to do. He's prepared mm -hmm. that good work for me to walk in. And often the good works he prepares us to walk in, it's like... Um, it's more like the you know walking up the sand dunes of Cronulla Beach. Mm. It's good works, but it's hard works. So I think when we think of good works, God prepares us to walk in. It's like we think the good works is some stroll in the park, but actually they're often hard. But but I think He's He calls us to do those things and to and if we've had a particular thing in our life, maybe that's preparing us to help someone else as well. Mm. Mm. Uh, you, you talked about an evangelism award at your school. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the, uh, yeah. Tell us that story. There's, there was, it was only last week. I mean, I could tell you about, I could tell you honestly five or six stories just from last week of unusual things. But last week, my father-in-law gave an, um, the school an evangelism award that was going to be in the name of Nathan. And I think it was given to a child. Um, uh, it was given to a child at the end of last year or the beginning of this year. But I don't think it had the name Nathan on the on the front of it, but it did inside the book. But anyway, what happened was my son went over to this guy's house and my son said, can I have a look at the thing? And it said Nathan on it. And this this boy who won the evangelism award at the school was told my son that he was converted in a sermon that someone else gave about a boy with cancer who'd survived, but they didn't know the name. He didn't mention the name. And so this boy... One, this boy became a Christian a couple of years ago through someone preaching, mentioned, talking about my son Nathan, even though he didn't mention it. And he won an award, which he didn't realise was about my son Nathan. <laughs> and yet it was, God had used my son Nathan to lead him to the Lord, among other things. And, and then this guy was preaching the gospel and won this evangelism award. And I'm sure there are many other aspects of his life, but I just found that really encouraging. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you talked to me about uh, listening to sermons or reading books by other people who'd lost children. Mm. Why is that, not particularly on grief topics, but why has that been an encouragement to you? Yeah, yeah. people who've walked that walk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's interesting. I've actually um, 
not wanted to read many things on grief. <laughs> I, I often, I mean, yeah, I don't know if you, yeah, I haven't read many things on grief, but I actually really wanted to read, read and listen to people who I know had been through a lot of suffering. It just, even though they didn't talk about it in their sermons, they didn't write about it in their books, you could see the love they had for Christ and for his mm-hmm. people, and you knew that they'd been tested in ways similar to me, and yet they still loved the Lord. And I just craved that. It was like a fellowship of people who've lo- who, who've, lo- who've gone through some hard things and still love the Lord. Um, I think that was be- heightened just after Nathan died. I, I don't crave as much, but I still do appreciate it. Um, I think when you when someone goes through suffering, they don't want to just face up suffering all the time. You want to actually hear about <laughs> about heaven, about Christ, about the resurrection, about. Um, the cost of discipleship, all the regular things you mm. want to hear. But um, yeah, we were we were given many books about grief and I, can, I honestly confess that I only read one, <laughs> one book about grief and the person who gave it to me wrote on the front of it, he says, if you feel like you don't want to read this or it's inappropriate or you can't, don't, don't worry, don't bother reading it. And I think that's what made me read it. <laughs> and I used to write that on everything. I give someone who's grieving, I say, or I tell them, look, Please don't read it. If you don't feel it, you have to read it. Like don't make. If you give someone a book on grieving, don't make it feel like a burden to them because mm. they might end up with 20 books on grieving and they won't have read them and they don't want to have to face you and realise that they haven't read them. But realistically, you just can't. Mm. Yeah. Um, you wrote a really helpful blog article um, on the anniversary of, your, uh, of Nathan's death and, um, and we'll link to it in the notes below. But just watch... Th- what have you learned from the scriptures that's helped you in this journey? So I wrote an article about um, sorrow upon sorrow for parents who lose a child. Um, I really, there's a few things I learned. I looked at all the, this is mainly the Old Testament, looked at the parents in the Bible who'd lost children and many of them reacted differently. Mm-hmm. Many of them reacted strangely. You know, David lost at least three sons more. Um, but three that we're told the story of, and he reacts so differently each of them. You know, Absalom, he just just breaks down. Absalom, Absalom. But then his other uh, his other son, as a baby, he just seems to mourn beforehand and have no reaction afterwards. People people react differently. But I think the biggest thing I learned was from the New Testament that Paul, who said we should grieve, but not as those without hope, mm-hmm. um, wasn't a stoic wasn't just believing that we have no emotions because elsewhere he also prayed to God and hoped that Epaphroditus would never die in Philippians and and he said that if he was so glad that God answered that prayer because he would have he's been spared from sorrow upon sorrow and I actually found putting those two things together really helpful that we do we grieve but we grieve with hope I I, I, I'm not worried from Nathan he is he's he's well off He's mm-hmm. with the Lord. I grieve for my wife. I grieve for my family. Um, I grieve for me. My, it's Nathan's friends. But there is another aspect that there is a reality that there is a sorrow upon sorrow mm. if, if someone dies. And I, and I think the Bible is just honest, very honest about that. Mm. That's good. There have been a wonderfully um, transformative work of the Spirit amongst some of Nathan's peers, some mm. 16-year-old, year 10, year mm. 11, mm. you know, and... Um, They've all now, two years later, just finished school. Mm. But what's some of the work of the Spirit of God in that group? Yeah, We, we, we had a, um, a moment last year. It was on Nathan's, close to Nathan's birthday, where a bunch of Nathan's friends wanted to come over. And they made a plaque. And they had a tree they wanted to plant. And I, I, I told them, and I could tell you and whoever's listening, <laughs> before they came, I was... It was hard. It was like, it was like bringing everything up again mm-hmm. to have that many, have a bunch of, it's just his school friends. Maybe it was about 18 or so, 18 or so 18 year olds, mm-hmm. um, 17, 18 year olds, uh, came over about, um, I think it was about four o'clock or something. And, uh, they all dug a hole for the tree. And mm-hmm. then because 18 of them did it, the hole was way too big. So they all had to fill it in again. <laughs> um, we, we prayed together. Most of them are believers, mm-hmm. but they stayed for about four and a half hours at our house. And there was a time when I was sitting back with Ruth talking to some of them and a, and a group of Nathan's friends were on our piano and singing around the piano songs of praise to God. And I thought to myself, 
it's just a, such a strange thing and, a, and a, sorry, an overwhelming thing that God would bring into our lives some of Nathan's friends still. And uh, these guys have been bold and come, come into our house and spent so long with us and you know, brought food along. And, and we've had a couple just pop over at different times and talk about issues. One of the guys on that day showed, showed us his testimony that he'd, he'd got baptised in his local Baptist church and part of his testimony was Nathan. Nathan. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Nathan facing sickness, Nathan facing death. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thanks for coming and sharing with us today. Thanks very much, Dominic. My guest on The Pastor's Heart has been Andrew Barry and uh, Andrew, of course, on the staff at uh, Janali Anglican Church in the uh, Sutherland Shire in the south of Sydney and uh, one of the keynote speakers at the Nexus Conference uh, next month. Um, we'll put the link to Andrew's blog, um, uh, The Bible, uh, A to Z, um, in the link below. And uh, next week on The Pastor's Heart, our guest is going to be David Cook, the former principal of Sydney Missionary and Bible College uh, and, of course, the chairman of that uh, Katoomba Christian Convention for 10, 15 years. And uh, he'll be speaking uh, with us about the whole topic of how do you preach to the heart. And uh, we're looking forward to having him as our guest next week. Thanks for uh, being with us this week on The Pastor's Heart. <laughs>